Good morning and welcome to today's SP Energy Networks event on funding a net zero future, supporting communities to build a green economy. This event will showcase innovative green energy fund projects to explore how investment has accelerated the net zero ambitions of communities across Scotland. I'm Carol Kirkwood, and you might recognise me as a BBC weather presenter. I've been a weather presenter for over 20 years, and I've seen firsthand the significant impact climate change is having on our weather in the UK. To give you some context, the UK's 10 warmest years on record have occurred since 2002, and heat waves are also now 30 times more likely to happen due to rising global temperatures. It's hard to miss the changes. Over the last two weeks, hundreds of world leaders have discussed and debated climate action at a global level here in Glasgow. They have sought to unite the world and keep the temperature of the planet under control. COP26 has been a much anticipated event across the world and here's hoping future generations will look back on this as a milestone moment. Here in the UK, we've pledged to reduce carbon emissions by 78% by 2035 and achieve net zero by 2050. That includes phasing out coal power by 2024 and ending the sale of new petrol and diesel vehicles by 2030. To achieve that, we need the technology and infrastructure to deliver net zero emissions. Three years ago, I joined SP Energy Networks at a brilliant event in Edinburgh to announce 21 new projects supported through its Green Economy Fund. I'm delighted to be your host this morning to celebrate the legacy and long-term impact of those projects as the fund comes to a close. Supporting the drive to net zero, the £20 million Green Economy Fund was established in 2018 to support the Scottish Government's ambitious energy strategy and the UK's drive to a low carbon economy by 2050. Through the outstanding work of Green Economy Fund projects, Scotland has made progress towards meeting climate change targets, boosted local economic growth, improved air quality and delivered a better future quicker for local communities. Today, you'll have the chance to meet some of those projects. From electric e-cargo bikes to battery storage technology, these projects are using their creativity to promote the availability and accessibility of net zero initiatives in Scotland. We'll hear from Soul Riders, Dumfries and Galloway College, Warmworks and Agile City, as well as the team behind the Green Economy Fund at SP Energy Networks and the Energy Saving Trust. I'm also delighted that we will be hearing about a new funding opportunity from SP Energy Networks. Scott Matheson, Director of Network Planning and Regulation at SP Energy Networks, will be sharing information about the launch of a new net zero fund. We'll be taking questions throughout the event using Slido, so please submit them by using the login details on the screen just now. But first, I'd like to introduce you to the women behind the Green Economy Fund. Gillian Violaris is the Green Economy Fund manager and has been instrumental in establishing the fund and coordinating the projects that it supports. So please, show your appreciation for Gillian. Um, thank you so much, Carol. Um, what a lovely um, introduction. Um, and thank you so much for being here again to ce um, celebrate the Green Economy Fund and also support us um, this morning. Um, it's great for you, for, all, for you all to be here this morning. Um, I know that it's maybe been a bit challenging trying to travel during COP at the moment, so I do appreciate you all taking the time to come this morning. So as Carol mentioned, um, today we're celebrating the kind of end of the Green Economy Fund. Um, we're going to hear from Scott a wee bit later on. He's going to talk about our future business plans and what funding opportunities are on the horizon. 
I hope most people here have some knowledge of the Green Economy Fund and will hear some from some of the inspirational projects that we've really had the privilege of funding over the last three years. Um, if you've not heard about the Green Economy Fund, I'm just going to take a little bit of a step back um, and give you a little bit more of the background to the fund. So back in 2018, with agreement from Ofgem, um, SP Engine Networks decided to invest £20 million um, to support the, lo the, the change to low carbon technology, support our communities and their drive for that change, their ambitions, and also a wider, Scotland's wider and green ambitions. In 2018, um, I was then asked, I was given the task of establishing the fund and the f a fund is something that we've never done before um, through a networks business um, here. So it was all new to me um, and we only had a couple of years to find projects and allocate the funding. So it was a pretty big challenge, if I'm being honest. Um, but quite quickly, we identified the Energy Savings Trust as a key partner to help us achieve um, this fund and make it a success. We recognised that they already helped Ofgem with one of the funding, um, administer one of the funds that they operate. So it just felt like a real natural fit that they would be able to come in, understand our business and support us um, with getting the fund up and running. So working in conjunction with the Energy Savings Trust, um, and also our key stakeholders and internal stakeholders, we developed the priorities of the fund and they became clear really quickly. So firstly, we wanted to obviously um, support projects that um, had an environmental impact and reduce carbon. I think that probably makes sense. Um, we wanted to support projects that focused not only on the decarbonisation of transport, but we also wanted to look at heat as well. We wanted to help create the future workforce required for this change, but we wanted our projects to go that little bit further. We wanted them to create a social and an economic impact. But more than that, we wanted them to be able to generate some learnings and widely share them so that we can help the Scottish Government and the UK achieve their net zero ambitions. So let me just bring you right up to date with the funds. So uh, since 2018, we've identified 35 projects which we have uh, funded through three rounds of funding. I'm pleased to say that um, we only have two projects still on the ground, mainly due to COVID um, reasons, but in the next six weeks, they will also complete. So we'll have completed 35 projects in three years, which is quite incredible and all credit to the projects who's delivered these incredible projects. Um, to identify the projects and decide which ones that we funded, it wasn't us that made the decision. We actually um, got the help of an external panel of experts who were able to um, look at the priorities and really recognise which projects met the priorities of the fund that I've described previously. I've been incredibly lucky to work with all 35 projects. They all range in size and scale and the amount of funding that we've been uh, lucky to, to give to them. Um, but there's so many standout projects, it's really hard for me to pick any. But, but to be honest with you, what really struck me when I've been going in the last few years, it's not really the projects, but it's the people behind the projects that have really, um, that really hit home to me and their absolute vision to make their pro the projects a reality. So early on in the fund, um, I met Rashid, and you'll hear from Rashid a wee bit later on, um, and his passion for his community and his drive to make his community more greener, it comes across um, in spades, and um, you'll hear from him later. One of our first round projects was uh, Community Transport Glasgow, and there I met Graeme Dunn. Graeme had the vision of transforming his ageing uh, fleet, uh, his community transport fleet, into a green fleet. And in the process of this transformation, he created a new fleet um, that was able to um, support um, his 75,000 vulnerable customers that he transports around the city of Glasgow each year. Andrew Mavery also stood out because he wanted to support his um, remote community, his remote rural community. He wanted to provide them with a low, car low carbon transport option. And by doing that, he established a, a community car club in Hoyk to support his community. But these are just a few examples of the many people that I've met over the years who have absolutely taken their vision and made it a reality and really stood out in their communities. 
As I said, there's so many projects that I can't mention them all. So today I'm really pleased to announce that we have, uh, we're actually launching our final report for the Green Economy Fund. And if you've managed to pick up a wee bag as you've come in, you'll find in there a, a QR code that will take you straight to the, the report um, online. And there you'll find details of all the projects, uh, the impacts that the projects have made over the years. Uh, we've got some case studies. Um, so please um, feel free to read that at some point. But today I'm really excited because you're going to hear firsthand from our projects. Um, we've also got some short videos. Again, I'll give you a bit of an overview of the projects that we have been privileged to support. And um, Felicity will also give you an overview of some of the lessons that we've learned um, over the years um, of supporting these projects. Just to conclude for me, um, the Green Economy Fund is something the SP Engine Networks have never done before. We're immensely proud that we've been able to invest in this way and leave an enduring legacy within our communities. In just three years, through the fund's investment, we have managed to create 58 jobs, another 600 indirectly. We've managed to support 7,000 vulnerable customers. We've managed to install 36 renewable generation measures. And we estimate that on an annual basis, we will save about 3,700 carbon dioxide equivalent from our projects each year, which I believe is roughly about a thousand cars off the streets of Glasgow each year. I feel tru truly privileged that I've been responsible for the fund and personally I've learned a great deal. I'm suddenly the boss expert in the business, I don't know how that happened and I never anticipated that. Um, but we recognise there's much more to be done if Scotland and the UK are to reach their net zero um, ambitions. And that's why we are committed to continuing our work in this area. Thank you for listening to me. And I'm going to now pass on to, back to Carol, who will introduce some of our lovely projects. Thank you. Thanks, Gillian. And Gillian, as ever, you are so humble. A big job, Gillian said. I think it was a huge job, so well done. So now we do have the chance to hear from some of the incredible projects funded by the Green Economy Fund. First up is Rashid Khalik, Chief Executive of Soul Riders. Thanks to funding from the Green Economy Fund, Soul Riders launched Scotland's first integrated e-cargo bike delivery and food waste service. It has saved nearly seven tonnes of carbon from vans and cars since launching its zero emission service in Glasgow last year. Before I pass you over to Rashid, we'll find out more about how the Green Economy Fund is electrifying transport across Scotland. We've invested over £11 million across 17 transport projects. We've funded 50 electric vehicles, allowing more people within our communities to access a range of electric vehicles and providing more access to charging infrastructure whilst encouraging active transport across Scotland. In partnership with First Bus, we introduced Glasgow's first state-of-the-art fully electric vehicles onto a commercial bus route since the 1960s. In Edinburgh, we worked in partnership with Lothian Bus to introduce the first fully electric double-decker buses, enabling Edinburgh to take a major step in its journey towards the city becoming net zero by 2030. We have enabled Scotland's first integrated e-cargo bike delivery and food waste service, helping save nearly seven tonnes of carbon from vans and cars since launching in Glasgow last year. We launched the UK's first fleet of six fully electric buses serving rural communities in partnership with Stagecoach West Scotland. This project was also the first in Scotland to introduce on-route charging capabilities and introduced Dumfries and Galloway's first electric bin lorries operating in a rural setting. Together, all of our projects have travelled over 330,000 miles already. That's the equivalent of 13 times around the world. The introduction of these types of transport solutions are essential as our towns and cities work towards climate change targets and for improving air quality and the general well-being of our communities. So let's welcome Rashid. Thank you, Carol. Good morning, everybody. Great to be here in Glasgow today. 
It's been a fabulous few days in Glasgow with everything that's going on. And I welcome the opportunity to tell you about Soul Riders and revolutionise our green project. So Soul Riders has been a real labour of love for me personally. Um, I've always been known as the cyclist within my peers. And back in the late 80s and early 90s when I was on a bike, um, you didn't see many Scottish Pakistani people riding a bike. This then developed when I met another gentleman who also was a Scottish Pakistani gentleman um, who rode a bike as well. And we put our heads together and said, we need to encourage other people from our communities to get on bikes. Lo and behold, we set up Soul, Rider, Soul Riders and as the co-founder and the founder, we put our heads together and developed really just a bunch of guys riding bikes and the HQ at the time was um, somebody's second room in their house. So you can imagine bikes everywhere, parts everywhere, and people coming in and out, uh, and a real um, greasy second living room, let's say. From there, we did the Pedal, Pedal of Scotland, which was a great ride from Glasgow to Edinburgh, where we had 50 soul riders doing 40 miles. Many of them were beginner cyclists, never ridden a bike before or indeed for a long time. Fast forward that to 2015, we thought we need to do something here, we need to establish something, we need to create a more formal organisation. We then developed Soul Riders the Charity with the vision to create stronger communities through cycling. Some key words in there, communities, it's all about the people, we're almost using cycling as a tool to engage with ethnic minorities, with people from diverse backgrounds. From there, through funding from Keep Scotland Beautiful, we managed to establish our community cycling centre, which is a melting pot of people from all walks of life based in Paul Shields East. Now, if anybody knows Paul Shields East, it is the most diverse, diverse place in Scotland. Um, it's actually akin to Miami, where there's a minority majority. You have 52% of people coming from ethnic minorities. So really a great place to establish the hearts of soul riders. As an ethnic minority organisation, we have many projects ranging from Soul Kids, funded by BBC Children in Need. That's our Young People's Project. We have Soul Sisters, led by women for women. We also have Pathways, a fabulous project, which really summarised as our poverty project. Um, we've given over 600 bikes away for free to some of the most vulnerable people in Glasgow, including new Scots, refugees and asylum seekers. Um, I would also add to do with Pathways, we've never received a penny, a penny of funding. It's all been done by volunteers and a real privilege to be part of. Now, there seems to be a huge void and a chasm when it comes to engaging with people from diverse backgrounds, um, the supposedly hard to reach groups. And this goes two ways. So um, ethnic minorities tend not to engage with mainstream services and it's across the board. You can include Scottish Enterprise, Business Gateway, Mental Health uh, uh, Institutes, etc. And mainstream services find it difficult to engage with diverse folk. What we've managed to do within Soul Riders is cross that bridge. And it, it isn't what we expected would happen, but we've created innovative solutions in order to create that engagement. We constantly talk about the barriers, the bar barriers to climate literacy, the barriers to climate uh, engagement, uh, the barriers to cycling. And often in Scotland, you hear a big barrier being the, the lovely Scottish weather. Um, but actually more than the weather, it's um, safety. Road safety is a huge barrier to getting folk onto bikes. Now, within Soul Riders, we also have these barriers, but also there's added layers to the onion, if you like. So you have stigmas associated with getting on a bike. You know, you've arrived on a, on a bike, can you not afford a car? Um, there's also accessibility and ownership issues within folk who come from diverse backgrounds in terms of affordability. 
So going through these barriers has meant that we've had to, by default, create innovative strategic solutions of taking somebody from being a non-cyclist to trying and trialling a bike to becoming a regular cyclist and then actually taking cycling as a lifestyle choice. No mean feat. Some of the innovative solutions have led to revolutionise, which is what I'm here to talk about today. Revolutionise is our green collection and delivery service using e-cargo bikes. And again, it's been a vision that's also been another labour of love. It's been fabulous, kick-started by the Green Economy Fund, um, where when we had no avenues open to us, um, uh, we came across the Green Economy Fund and it really catalyzed what we were looking to do. The initial purpose was to take cars, vans and trucks off the road, saving huge carbon emissions and also to demonstrate to households how you can indeed do your ASDA shopping, take items and even your kids to carbon hotspots like schools. This green transport solution meant that we could embed this green solution not only within businesses but households demonstrating how you can do your big weekly shopping, you can actually transform your business and transform your logistics. What we did within businesses and charities, we would take a before and after picture. Um, so we would look at your carbon footprint, your uh, time spent doing logistics and the money it would cost. And then we would demonstrate using an after picture in terms of the carbon foot footprint saving the efficiency and also the social impact. Very important to our cause and indeed our litmus test. If there's no social impact, we probably wouldn't be involved in the project and I'll come on to that if I may. So for instance, um, we have managed to skewer a number of clients uh, through Revolutionise. Um, if anybody knows about the Barclays campus on Glasgow's wonderful riverfront, it is one of the biggest constructions uh, uh, taking place in the UK where Barclays amalgamated 28 of their global office into one super campus. Barclays has not had one food waste truck appear within its doors. It's all been done by Revolutionise. Yep. There's been no noise, no six mile per gallon trucks coming down emitting vast amount of emissions. We've literally saved thousands of kilograms in carbon working with Barclays. We've also taken their food surplus from their canteens, which we then distribute to um, food banks, um, pantries, so that some of the most poverty driven people in, in Glasgow can eat and have that basic necessity. And the important th thing there is with dignity rather than waiting in a queue in, in a soup kitchen. We've also worked on the other end of the scale with the likes of Milk Cafe, um, a really nice, independent, funky, organic, vegan food, do wonderful spicy soup. And with the Milk Cafe, we've provided a catering facility for them, delivering in a zero emission fashion their food. We've also collaborated with another charity to uh, distribute um, during the pandemic uh, food to some of the, again, the most isolated people in Glasgow who not only could, couldn't leave their house due to, due to either being elderly, um, they also might have been New Scots refugees and asylum seekers. So not only is it for businesses, it's, it's also for local neighbourhoods feeding into creating a 15 minute neighbourhood. Now, within that, I've personally seen families in our local area in Pollock Shields struggle to do the things that we take for granted, taking your shopping home. We have families who, um, you know, I remember seeing a mother of two taking her little three-year-old girl and, you know, and this three-year-old girl was carrying one of the biggest shopping bags I'd ever seen simply to take to go home and really struggling. And I actually called my crew, which is our staff and volunteers over, and I said, look, this is the work that we do because we provided the lady with a free bike um, with a basket on it and she was adamant she wanted a basket on it and we then learned later on why that was. But through Revolutionise, 
we can create a little bit of comfort, a little bit of ease for these communities, for these um, groups of people. Revolutionize is also one of the few closed loop recycling models that can be um, uh, used on site. So for instance, in this building here, you could have a rocket composter on site. You can take your food down straight to the composter and create that circular economy. So a really unique thing in terms of recycling and reuse. Huge carbon savings, um, avoiding food going to landfill. The um, trucks who then travel miles to get to their de depot to do whatever reuse um, they were to do. We have then created several strands within Revolutionize, which we are now looking to explore. Um, carbon hotspots, like I mentioned, the school run are huge. In Copenhagen, um, actually well-to-do families have dropped their Bentleys. And the in thing in Copenhagen just now is to ride along on your, car in, on your cargo bike. So this turnkey solution um, for businesses, for residents, is, has been a great learning for, for us. Something that we've discovered through working with the Green Economy Fund, with SP Energy Networks, has been absolutely fabulous. I, can't, I cannot talk enough about what we've learned in the last year and a half. Because you can design um, on paper you know, what you think you're going to do. Once you've actually done it, that is the learning. Once you've then had your successes and all the peaks and troughs that create those successes, um, it's great because we've now got a shovel ready project which we can now scale up. So what is the future for Soul Riders? What is this, the future for um, Revolutionize? As a social enterprise, which Carol uh, alluded to, sorry, uh, Gillian alluded to in terms of creating an enterprise which also has social impact and business and enterprise and sustainability all weaved within there. The ingredients for us are fabulous. What we're now looking to do is springboard on the learning in the last two years, whereby we are now looking at bringing food, energy and transport together. We're looking at models containing vertical farming, the zero emission transport solution to create a cherry picked zone within this wonderful city. This would be perhaps Glasgow's first net zero zone. And what that actual, actually means to myself, to the professionals, to layman's, is a real interesting question. What does net zero actually look like? We believe everyone should be involved in this. And our forte is engagement. Our forte is creating grassroots scalability, which I believe is not a bottom up approach or a top down approach, it's a balanced approach. With everything that's going on in Glasgow, the future is wonderful, I think, in terms of everything that's going on, what we've learned through the pandemic, what we've learned um, in the last few years in Revolutionize. Creating these micro hubs, regional and city hubs, is what we're looking to do in several cities within the UK. We're indeed speaking to associates and friends that I know in, in Europe to expand our project. By including everyone, it is that just transition and we welcome everybody to bring the jigsaw together for everyone to find their sweet spot solution and then come together so that we can hit our targets. We would love to see, um, I would love to see Glasgow, my hometown. I was born in Bristol, but don't hold that against me, to become Glasgow to become the UK's first net zero city. And more importantly, I would love to see Glasgow to become a flagship community cycling smart city. Thank you. Thanks, Rishi. That was so interesting. Now, next up, we have Joanna Campbell, Principal and CEO of Dumfries and Galloway College. Thanks to funding from the Green Economy Fund, a new green energy hub was launched at Dumfries and Galloway College last year to help prepare the next generation for green jobs. But first, we'll watch a quick video on how the Green Economy Fund has invested in education and training.
The transition to a green economy will require a workforce with the right skills. Therefore, education plays an important role in the move to a low carbon economy. We've invested almost £1 million across our education projects, working in partnership with 11 colleges across Scotland. We've funded a network of green hubs across Scotland, installing a range of low carbon technologies, helping to create valuable teaching aids for students. We've supported 2,300 nursery and primary school pupils to learn more about greener solutions, creating interactive workshops, powering the next generation of STEM talent. These flagship education projects support our net zero ambitions and help to inspire the next generation of green energy experts and develop the workforce of the future. Let's welcome Joanna. Good morning everybody, my name is Joanna Campbell, I'm the principal at Dumfries and Galloway College and I'm delighted to be here today to outline to you the, the benefit and the profound impact that our award from the Green Economy Fund had on not just the physical environment within the college but also how it aided us to reduce our carbon footprint and also the benefit it has had on our student experience and creating the workforce of the future. Before I do that, I think, it's first just to out, I think it's first important to outline to you a bit of context around this as well. So for those of you that don't know, Dumfries and Galloway College, as the name suggests, is based in the southwest of Scotland. We have two campuses, one in Dumfries and one 75 miles away in Stranraer. I joined the college just under three years ago, and one of the first things I had to do was work with the board and the staff to outline what was going to be our strategic plan for the next five years. And one of the things that um, we collectively wanted to do was to look at where we could develop a niche and be sector leading. And one of those areas was around the work that we had already been doing on uh, green energy and supporting the, the climate emergency. So we had all, as I say, we'd already been working in that area, but really what we wanted to do was we wanted to go further and we wanted to go further faster. So we identified that as a college, what we wanted to do was be net zero by 2030. And I'm pleased to say that with the help of the Green Economy Fund, we're actually well on our way to achieving that. But what we also did as an organisation was we created a climate emergency action plan and that was developed through a climate emergency action group. Now, it would be very easy for me to um, stipulate what, should be, what our focus should be and what our actions could be, but I didn't feel that was the right thing to do in isolation. So we involved our students, we involved our community and we also involved the college staff in that. And they have been absolutely pivotal in driving forward what we're doing in this area. And really that was about embedding sustainability within our college culture. Dumfries and Galloway as a region is um, a net exporter of renewable energy. So for example, we generate three times as much energy from renewable sources than we will actually ever use. So as a region, the college was well placed to play into the work that we are doing across the southwest of Scotland. The other thing we were involved in as a college was the work that's happening right across college sector. So you've seen in the video that this is something that all colleges are actively involved in. And we've gone one step further. We've actually all signed a climate commitment through the College Development Network. And we have all uh, collectively agreed to a set of actions that we will embed within our institutions to take this even further. So if I go back to the Green Economy Fund, the funding was used to develop a physical environment and you saw in the video that was just played there, really that was essentially about buying pieces of capital equipment that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to afford. 
We opened a green energy centre in the summer of 2020 and Spen were involved in that. And that was an extension to our Dumfries campus. What we wanted to do was we wanted to, um, we wanted to have a completely carbon neutral facility on our Dumfries campus that we could train the workforce that we needed for the future. So the investment that we had from the Green Economy Fund helped us create the facilities that would allow us to do that. So when we were awarded that investment, we installed ground and air source heating systems, wind, a wind turbine, we also installed electric vehicle charging points, and we had two different solar arrays. So we had the domestic solar array and we also had the commercial solar array as well and um, so effectively the whole of that centre was sourced from renewable energy and the equipment that we've installed we use that as a, an experiential training environment for our students so effectively not only does it do the, jo do the job of reducing our carbon footprint but we can also train people on that as well and that was a really innovative part of our funding that we wanted to accelerate and we feel that what we've been doing is sector leading and this is an exemplar that others will be able to, to um, copy in years to come. So I guess that you could say is the legacy of the, the funds that we have. In September this year, what we then went on to do was launch our Green Energy Skills Academy. And as I said, before a lot of this was about developing the future workforce. We've worked very closely with Skills Development Scotland in supporting the development of the Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to be able to offer training in the, on the, using the facilities that we had installed, but also looking at what other types of training would we need, could the college offer to support the, the green jobs of the future. So our training isn't just about full-time programmes, it's about the school college partnership, it's about upskilling, retraining opportunities for people who are moving from one sector to another. And um, really for us, that has been groundbreaking. So if I give you a couple of examples, we have been working with our local authority who have a huge challenge ahead in terms of the installation of electric vehicle charging points and also the maintenance of their fleet. So we've been working very closely with them to provide training. And there's a whole host of other initiatives that we've been involved in as well. But as I've said before, we wouldn't have been able to do this without that initial investment from the Green Economy Fund. So what's next for Dumfries and Galloway College? Well, our college purpose is to be one step ahead and that's exactly what we intend to do. And, you know, without that investment from the Green Economy Fund, we wouldn't be able to be one step ahead. So where we are now is we are starting to look at one of our other areas of expertise, which is digital and bringing digital alongside the work that we've done in uh, green energy and looking now at climate tech. So, you know, we will continue to, to work in this area and do more and do more faster. And the other area that we're looking at at the moment is advanced manufacturing. So we're very much focused on clean engineering and we've done that through a significant project that we've been involved in with the South of Scotland Enterprise and our local, our local authority. So to finish the story off then, um, what I wanted to say was that the college was the, well, it was um, given the Green Gown Award last year for being the most sustainable institution in the UK. And we were up against really stiff competition across the college and university sector. And I am so proud of the work that the college has done in this space. We've been shortlisted for the International Green Gown Award and this year, we have also been shortlisted for another Green Gown Award as Campus of the Future. So none of that would have been possible without the, the impact and that initial investment that we had from the Green Economy Fund. So I think it's safe to say that the legacy of that has, um, will, will live with us for years to come. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Joanna. Is anybody else frightened to cough in these days out loud in public? I mean, it's brilliant to hear the benefit that your students are already getting from the new training hub. Now we're going to have a short comfort break, but just for five minutes. So please feel free to stretch your legs, help yourself to some water, and let's be back in five minutes, just after 20 past 10. Thanks. En amour, comment je fais pour être ce que je suis Je réponds généralement, si je le savais. Welcome back, everyone. Now, before the break, we heard from Gillian, Rashid, and Joanna about green investment and some of the brilliant innovations taking place in transport and education. If you have any questions for Gillian, Rashid, and Joanna, or in fact, any of our other speakers, please submit them using Slido. Now, next, I'd like to introduce you to Ross Armstrong, Managing Director for Warmworks. Warmworks Scotland secured funding from SP Energy Network's Green Economy Fund to deliver an innovative battery storage project to help reduce energy costs in 133 homes in Dumfries and Galloway. Follow-up analysis has shown that some households have seen their energy bills drop by more than half. But first, we'll hear what the Green Economy Fund has done to decarbonise heat across Scotland. We've invested over £4 million across seven projects to help boost innovative low-carbon heat technologies. In partnership with Warmworks, we've helped reduce energy costs by 83% in 133 off-gas homes in Dumfries and Galloway, where fuel poverty is disproportionately high by the installation of battery technology. We've helped transform the 1920s Civic House into a modern community hub and shared workspace that supports creative learning and social enterprises. Agile City. A core principle of the building's development was to create a leading example of carbon reduction innovation and create Scotland's first retrofit passive warehouse. In partnership with Sunamp, we've delivered micro-district heating networks to reduce heating bills and carbon emissions for vulnerable customers in Edinburgh. We've installed new ground source heat pump tech and insulation at Ochengray Church Centre as part of a major renovation in Lanarkshire. Our projects are helping develop new, innovative approaches to the low carbon heating of our homes and buildings, reducing carbon, energy bills, keeping our homes warmer and developing a pathway for future projects. So, let's welcome Ross. Great. Um, thanks, Carol, for the introduction. Um, and thanks very much to Spend for the opportunity to come and talk to you about the project today. Um, just to um, explain a little bit about Warmworks, a bit of background and who Warmworks are. Warmworks was founded in 2015 and our mission was, well, we were founded to deliver the Scottish Government's national um, fuel poverty grant scheme, Warmer Home Scotland. Um, and in the last six years, we've helped more than 25,000 households across Scotland to be in warmer, more energy efficient homes, um, heating the homes at a lower cost in a more affordable way. Um, I guess the, you've already heard uh, this morning from um, really, really good uh, sessions from the, the transport side and the education side. And I think partly what I'm going to talk about is more the social side of, of what the Green Economy Fund's been able to achieve. And the social side is hugely important in the wider context of a just transition. It's a term that we're hearing a lot about now, just transition, and that, that's a good thing. But I think we have to understand what just transition means in practical terms. A just transition isn't just a moral point. A just transition is a practical point. We have to go through a massive process of societal, technological and environmental change at every level over the next 15 to 20 years. And the reality is on a practical level, there will be no transition at all unless there is a just transition. Because we can't have a transition to net zero that leaves behind 15 to 20 percent of the population who can't, won't or aren't able to get there by themselves. And that really plays to the heart of what this project was about in a very small and, uh, I guess, microcosmic way. For us, we've always been about looking at new technologies and how they apply to people in or at risk of fuel poverty. I think we'll talk about battery storage in a moment. We'll talk about what the technology was all about. 
I think if everyone in this room was offered the prospect of a, a Tesla Powerwall in the, their home and you download the Tesla app and you set the settings and you look at your energy tariff and you do all the things you need to do to optimize the kit, we'd all say, well, yeah, that's fine. It would take us about two or three days and we're up and running with it. But for people in fuel poverty who have to make the choice about do they put the heating on or do they put food on the table for their kids on a night time, the choices aren't always as simple. And technology is one part of the solution. We can do what we like to houses and buildings and properties, they're just bricks and mortar. But people live in houses. And what we have to do is understand how this technology can be applied and made useful for people who need that extra care, support, um, and I guess education to, to maximize the technology that's available. And that led us on to battery storage as an emerging technology within the overall mix um, and drive towards decarbonization of heat. For us, we wanted to look at a project that would look specifically at homes that were in or at risk of fuel poverty, provide battery storage and understand what needed to be done to get that technology scaled up on a national basis. We chose Dumfries and Galloway as the area to work in because, as you've already heard from Joanna, it's a net exporter of renewable energy. Um, there are issues there with constraint payments and things. They're, they have so much renewable generation. So there's, I guess, an apt discussion to be had around storage already in that region. But large parts of Dumfries and Galloway are off the gas grid. And being off the gas grid will mean that you are more vulnerable to fuel poverty. Mains gas is still the cheapest and most effective way to heat your home. If you're off gas, you don't have access to the cheapest way to heat your home, you can be more likely to be in fuel poverty and spending more money to heat your home than you necessarily are able to afford. For us then, once we selected the region, we then looked at what are the, the fuel poverty dynamics in the area, worked with uh, Changeworks, one of our joint venture partners, to identify the, the areas of the region where there were greatest risk of fuel poverty. And then we overlaid that with homes that were definitely electrically heated um, and off the gas grid. So once we had that subsection of, um, as Carol said, 133 properties that we were targeting, we looked at homes that were off the gas grid, um, electrically heated and more vulnerable um, to fuel poverty. We worked with Dumfries and Galloway Housing Partnership as the uh, landlord of the properties that we worked with. Um, I have to give them credit as a terrific partner and really supportive in working with us as the RSL. We also had very, very valuable support from the Scottish Power Energy Network's um, operational team in the region. If you fit in 133 brand new battery assets onto a grid um, across that size, it's not, I think it's easy. Turns out when we met the operational team, it isn't. Um, they were really, really supportive and ge genuinely the project wouldn't have worked without them. So we were very reliant on the support of our partners who get an immense amount of credit for, for the success of the project in the end. The project worked on the basis that once we'd identified the households, we would talk to them initially about what their current setup was. What was their tariff? What was their heating arrangements? What was their metering arrangements? What were they paying? What were their costs? Um, and talk to them about what the process of having a battery would mean. Because the process of expectation management in homes that are in fuel poverty cannot start early enough. You need to talk to them about what the project's about, what it's going to do, how they'll use it, how it'll interact with the heating, what they'll need to do, what they won't need to do, and all of those good stuff needs to happen early in the discussion. Uh, amusingly, one of the projects, one of the properties that we put a battery in actually phoned us up afterwards and said, well, this is brilliant, son, but you put a spaceship in my house. How do I use it? <laughs> and if you look at a Tesla Powerwall, it's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty modern looking thing. And for people who um, don't necessarily know what it's all about, it can be quite intimidating. So getting that education in up front was really, really important. We then had the process of installation, which again, speaking as somebody totally non-qualified and non-technical was a relatively straightforward process. Um, it took generally about a day um, to get the battery installed. We would um, work with the customer. Lots of the installations were carried out during the period of the pandemic. So obviously there's a lot of um, precautions and um, health and safety protocols in place to make sure customers and tenants were protected. But during the installation process, we again made sure that the installers, the contractors that we worked with, were skilled and trained and able to talk to the customer about what they were doing and what it was going to mean for them once they handed the technology over. Once the batteries installed, they were paired up to the Tesla app, which we as Warmworks had a central team that centrally controlled all of the batteries, 133 batteries. So you can see them all within the same application. We were setting charging times, we were setting optimized charging times according to what heating arrangements and tariff arrangements customers had in place so that we could maximize the bill reductions. Uh, as Carol's already said, some of the tenants that had batteries installed saw their energy bills drop by more than half versus what they had when the battery, before the battery was installed. 
And it's really important just to pause on that. We didn't install any heating technology. We didn't install any additional insulation, any fabric measures. All we did was install a battery, optimize the charging times to the tariff that the customer was on, and then ensure that the education piece was there for a handover so the customer knew what was going on and how to use it. We work with an organization called Citrus Energy who were very, very supportive. They're an independent charitable organization who give tariff advice. That was a hugely important part of the project. The best way for a customer to optimize that battery is obviously to ensure that it's charging at the cheapest possible times of the day. So some of our customers were switched on to agile tariffs, flexible time of use tariffs, and some of our customers will switch on to a time of use tariff that isn't called a smart time of use tariff, it's called economy seven. Um, and it used to be really unpopular and unfashionable. But what we're discovering is actually, if you have a customer in a property that's on an economy seven tariff, who charges storage heating during the night, if you charge the battery during those same cheap hours for charging, then that tenant, that customer wakes up in the morning, all of their heating is from the storage heating that is charged at the cheap rate overnight and all of their lighting, power, sockets and remaining electricity use is from the battery, which is obviously a 13 and a half kilowatt battery. It's a, it's a substantial unit. They're able to use all of the cheap electricity that's in the battery for the remaining needs to heat the house. Now, I'm not telling you that 133 households did this, but some households were saving upwards of 70 percent on their energy bills. A massive, massive saving. Part of that is getting them on the right tariff. Part of that is the battery then being optimized to match the tariff. And part of that is the education piece about talking to people about what they do, what they use and how they use it. Some unintended benefits, well not unintended, I think we probably knew them, but seeing them was a, a, a fascinating thing. From the batteries, we had one customer who had a medical need of constant electricity in his house, um, was hooked up to um, oxygen at home, um, had a need of constant electricity. Obviously, a, from Spen's point of view, a, a priority customer, a priority services customer. He had a power cut in his street, all of his street went off for an hour, his battery kicked in and he didn't notice any interruption. He didn't even know there'd been a power cut. We had two more customers like that with dialysis and other sort of home medical needs who obviously they didn't go through the same one hour long power cut interruption and things like that, but it is a part of the grid where power cuts can happen, outages can happen. So knowing that we have that protection on the health side and the vulnerability side, as well as the potential bill reductions, meant that we were effectively getting two benefits um, together for this vulnerable customer group. It's a really, really important lesson to kind of take forward that the, the, the installation of the battery isn't just about the benefit in terms of bills, it isn't just in terms of health. Um, we also talked to the operational colleagues and spend about the potential benefits for network resilience um, and potentially, he says with a capital P, um, uh, network upgrade costs, network infrastructure costs potentially being mitigated or offset by storage and, and smart storage um, in particular regions. So the benefits of the project went on beyond just the energy bill savings. A final one to talk about is, of course, having these assets in people's properties, if we can control them, you can then build aggregation potential. And that's something that we're going to be looking at, as, I guess, as a legacy of the project. We're working with aggregation providers to see how the energy that's the spare energy that is in batteries in people's homes can be sold back to the grid and vice versa so that you get this additional income stream that can be shared with the tenants in terms of uh, working with the housing partnerships, potentially uh, drive rent reductions and things like that. So there's lots of, I guess, future legacy projects if the batteries can act as a, a platform for aggregation that we are also going to be exploring over the next coming months. Um, so a big range of uh, really positive outcomes for tenants, uh, for the network, um, and for Warmwork. Since the project concluded, um, we've now introduced battery storage as a mainstream grant-funded measure on the Warmer Home Scotland programme, which was funded by the Scottish Government that I mentioned earlier. So the Scottish Government took notice of this report, the conclusions and what we've done and said we really want that to be installed as a measure on the mainstream grant programme, which helps about 5,000 properties a year. So we can now start to scale up the installation of this technology and make sure that it's coupled with the education and the support that customers need from start to finish. And I guess in terms of lessons going forward, just to kind of conclude, for us, there's a number of things to, to reflect on. Um, some challenges, I've talked a lot about the positive benefits and the positive outcomes. I think it's fair to say that lots of the 133 households that we helped didn't have the smoothest experience in terms of the energy retail end of the market. I think the energy retail end of the market wasn't always particularly interested 
in off-gas customers that were in fuel poverty in parts of rural Dumfries and Galloway. They don't necessarily get offered the same whiz-bang, smart, um, clever tariffs that people who live in city centres and in densely populated areas get. So there's clearly a point for the energy market here that on the retail side, that as tariffs become more flexible and we get smart time of use tariffs available on a, a sort of a more national scale, they are going to have to make sure that that is genuinely an accessible thing that's available to all. Back to the point earlier about a just transition, there is no point in offering 80% of the population clever technology, clever tariffs and clever market innovation and forgetting about the 20% that you still need to take with you. So there's a lesson there for the retail end of the market in terms of that process. I think um, from the DNO's point of view, from an operational perspective, they are already looking at some of the things that um, this project revealed, on, even albeit on the small scale that we did it. I think there are lots of challenges to the DNO, the DNO in terms of the decarbonisation agenda, heat pumps and EVs and all of the demands that will place on the grid. Hopefully this project starts to frame some of the questions about storage. And I guess more broadly, there's a lesson for all of us really, and, and just to conclude on the point that I started with, that we've got a massive journey to go on. We've got a huge amount to do. But unless we bring everyone with us and we make the changes that we need to make accessible for everyone, we will not succeed. And I'll just conclude there. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ross. What a fantastic way to help people reduce their bills and their impact on the environment. And I love that imagery about you've installed a spaceship in my house. It's brilliant. Then next, I'd like to introduce you to Rob Morrison, director of Agile City. Unfortunately, Rob is isolating at the moment, so he'll be joining us via Zoom just shortly. Agile City has led the renovation of Civic House, an iconic 1920s print works in Glasgow's Spears Locks. The post-industrial building has been transformed into an innovative community hub and shared workspace that supports creative learning and social enterprises. The space is also powered by solar panels on its roof. Renewable energy is at the forefront of tackling climate change. So let's find out more about how the Green Economy Fund is supporting the rollout of new renewable technology. We've invested over £2 million across seven projects focused on the installation of renewable technologies. We've created 36 new sources of renewable energy, from hydro projects to solar power installations. In partnership with Halo Kilmarnock, we're delivering an enterprise and innovation hub powered by a low carbon energy system to support businesses and the wider community. We've helped Salton Park in Edinburgh save more than 28 tonnes of carbon emissions since becoming the UK's first eco-powered green space last year. Twelve communities have been able to fit solar installations, with the income generated being reinvested back into the work these community groups undertake. We're supporting the introduction of renewable generation across Scotland to ensure communities can benefit from generating carbon-free energy locally. Hi Rob, can you hear us okay? Uh, I can hear you. That's can you hear me? Good. Yeah, we can hear you. We hope that you're feeling okay and we'll send you best wishes. We wish you were here. <laughs> But Rob, over I to you now. That too. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'm actually okay. It's um, uh, I just have to isolate because I've had a close contact. Um, oh, so thanks for your concern. Um, but all is well. Um, and again, yeah, sorry I can't be there in person to be with you all. Um, so, yeah, as Carol said, my, my name is Rob Morrison. I'm the director of Agile City, which is a community interest company based in Spears Locks in North Glasgow, next to the canal. Um, we operate across two buildings. Um, one's called Civic House and the other one is called Glue Factory. Um, and our, our, the purpose of the organisation is to repurpose these spaces um, to create work and production space for those working across cultural, social and green enterprise. Um, so to, in terms of the presentation today, I'm going to just speak a bit about the overview of the project and to give a sense of what we delivered via the Green Economy Fund. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the successes or what I think that the successes have been, um, the lessons learned and the future aspirations. Um, so 
To start with an introduction to the Green Economy Fund project, which, as I said, was looking at the retrofit of Civic House, which is a post-industrial space. Um, and the aspiration here is to retrofit it up to passive house standards, which we believe is probably the first Scotland's first passive house retrofit of a post-industrial building. Um, so that for us is a big uh, like a driver for the project. Um, so to come back to the context, which I think for us is incredibly important. So Civic Civic House was built in the 1920s as a print works for Civic Press. Um, as I said, it's based in Spears Locks, North Glasgow. So this was a this is an area just below the canal, um, about 10 minutes from where you guys are now, going north. Um, and because of its proximity to the canal, had there's a, it, there's a huge amount of industrial development over the years, um, and and it was one of the most because of that heavy industry, it was actually um, at one point one of the most densely populated areas in Western Europe. Um, but subsequently, as industry declined and as the canal was less um, important in the movement of goods and materials, other areas in the city developed further, like around the Clyde and other areas um, in Glasgow. And um, with that came the, um, the in decline of industry in the area and a lot of the buildings became underutilized and unpopulated. Um, and these issues were enhanced um, with the construction of the M8 motorway in the 1960s, which is in lots of ways cut off the north of the city from the city centre. Um, this meant that the, there's long-standing impacts of social and economic deprivation with vast amounts of vacant and derelict land and buildings. Um, so a huge this area, because of this, these issues, have become a big priority for Glasgow City um, Council, and there has been fund. There was funding awarded in 2016 from Scottish Government, um, the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund, and we were fortunate to be recipients of some of that funding um, to purchase Civic House and to start the um, development process of that building, um, with the aspiration that it becomes an asset for the local communities and people working and living in that area. Um, and so since 2017, we've been on a bit of a process of discovery. Um, we bought the building. We didn't really know that what we didn't know a great deal about the building apart from what the survey could tell us. And it's been a process of slowly stripping back the building to reveal um, its true strengths. And it's it's an incredible space um, that is built with fantastic materials. There's a photo I think on your screen just now of the interior. So it's like got mud, like built with really good quality brick, stone, um, steel and when often in these areas, these buildings are overlooked and just torn down. So our, a big part of our project was thinking about how they could be repurposed. Um, and the way that we work, and as Agile City, is, as the name might suggest, is that we don't, a lot of our building projects, and when we take on a space, we really, it's a, we develop the vision for these buildings through the activity that it can host. So we develop the spaces, um, we host and program a lot of different types of events. And we engage with the people who we believe are the, who are the audience for the space and by opening it up and hearing their feedback. And in essence, testing ideas, not just ideas about how the building can operate architecturally, but also the, the type of program and activity it can run and also the type of business that, it, that will sustain it going forward. Um, so this this process since 2017 has allowed us to understand the build the building what is and is going to become um, a co-working space um, to host people working flexibly, um, a canteen um, for um, vegetarian and vegan food, um, a venue for events and meeting spaces. As and that the, 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 these facilities will aim to support our community of those working across social, cultural, and green enterprises to thrive. Um, so that's the sort of that's the that's the ambition for the building. Um, and alongside that, um, we in 2018 we started to develop our energy strategy. And really, our and the vision for this is to consider this building and potentially other buildings as micro power stations of energy and ideas to help drive Scotland's journey to net zero. That's what has underpinned our spend project, but also the ongoing development of the building. So what did this involve? Um, with the support of the Green Economy Fund, um, we, the, 
we looked, we approached this as a, in a, a, a passive house design methodology, which is about very high performance insulation, air tightness, and, and looking at the internal ventilation systems to ensure that the heat that is generated within the building stays within the building um, rather than escaping. So this essentially was, um, the building was externally fit, retrofit with um, external wall insulation. So in essence, um, just a, a big sleeping bag. The, the building's really long and thin, and so we just basically, the whole building has now been completely wrapped. Um, in so doing, it improved the air tightness of the space dramatically. So we did air tightness tests before and after to make sure that the, previously the building leaked like a sieve, and there was just like huge um, air vents that allowed the building historically to ventilate itself. Now we've made the building very airtight, so we've taken a huge amount of airflow going from the inside to the outside. To when the previous test estimates that the amount of gaps is about the size of an A3 sheet of paper, um, which we're going to have another program of works to sort of tighten up that even further. We installed triple glazed windows um, that were Passive House certified that were from um, Finland, um, an internal mechanical ventilation heat recovery system, which, is set, which ensures that the heat that is generated within the building um, is is retained within the space as new fresh air is brought in from the outside. And that operates at about 95% efficiency rating. Um, and then on top of all that, we've then installed on the roof a 50, 50 kilowatt system of photovoltaic solar panels. Um, so in essence, these measures combined means that we have been able to reduce our heating demand by 90%. So that is before any other sort of um, efficiency measures in terms of like battery storage that was discussed before. Um, so our actual demand for heating the building at a consistent 20 degrees um, internally has been reduced by 90%. And then that combined with generating power from the 50 kilowatt PV system, we should that we will be energy positive over the course of a year, allowing us to power the building, obviously, but also ex like power points for cars externally, for bikes, and also our external, the, the external spaces we're currently in that are under development. And on top of all that, we, we will be, be hopefully be then on, be putting power back into the grid. So I think for us, a massive part of this project is um, rather than consuming vast amounts of energy, which these buildings, which this building historically did, um, they, they they now have the potential to generate power at a local level, which I think is like so, and contribute to the local local power grid, but also tell a story of how that's possible. Um, so that's the context, that's the nature of the project. Just quick, I'll, I'll just talk about the successes, or what I believe them to be. Um, so, if anyone who knows Glasgow well, or potentially a lot of the areas of the west of Scotland, Glasgow has a vast amount of vacant industrial buildings and sites, um, and for us, a massive part of this project is to create a scalable prototype of how to retrofit post-industrial buildings to become energy positive. These buildings are, in my opinion, they're incredible spaces. They're never going to be built again. The quality of the build, the quality of the materials, and the, the, the quality of the interior in, environments of these buildings will never be built because the, the, it would never be cost effective to do so again. But often in processes, processes of regeneration, they're torn down for new build. So this is wasting vast amounts of embedded carbon and energy. And these buildings, rather than being um, demolished, they need to be reused and repurposed to become productive spaces, not just for the economy, but also for the, the vast amount of cultural, social and economic heritage that exists within them. They tell a story of what Glasgow has become, what was before, and they tell a story of what it can become in the future. Um, and another success for me is that people have a genuine interest in how this project is delivered. Like they, they, these buildings exist, and often it's community organisations like ourselves, or social or arts charities, or different industrial units that are occupying these spaces that are prohibitively expensive to run. And people want to know how to make them more efficient and to how they can be a positive contribution to our city. Um, so we've been providing tours, information, talks like this, and really just sharing examples of how the space can be retrofit, but also used as a living example. As a public building, it offers, the pe offers people the opportunity just to walk in and understand how it, um, understand a living example of how these, these spaces can be 
um, this idea of being a micro power station. And, and, and I guess lastly, the success, like in simple terms, is the building's warm and nice to be in, which previously it wasn't. Um, it's low cost to run and especially, and we've got, there's, we've got resilience now to future price changes, which is obviously very topical in the news um, currently. Um, and so for an organization like ourselves, we can invest all those savings back into delivering projects, events, and outreach activities that will have positive contributions to our local economy and the local communities that we engage with. Um, so the lessons learned. Um, the, a big lesson has been about the way that we've dealt, managed the, the, the construction project um, the construction of the, the project. We opted, rather than going for a main contractor for all of these elements, we opted to go for, to individually appoint subcontractors who were experts at insulation, trip, the window installations, the ventilation system installate, installs, the PV panels. So we ourselves, as Azure City, and that my job was to individually contract all of those. We did that because we wanted to have we wanted to work with experts and wanted to reduce the the lines of communication so that we we got the best possible job. I underestimated how long that would take as a, uh, to manage those overlaps, but and I think that and I can talk if anyone has an interest in that. I can talk more about other ways that we could have approached that if we did it again. The other the other issue which I was mentioned in the previous presentation is around doing projects and these types of work when through the occupation where people are living or using the building that has been very difficult to manage um through different phases of construction um i mean an obvious one is to say delivering a construction project during a global pandemic hasn't been particularly easy um, that's been incredibly challenging and i appreciate the patience of um the spend fund and also the um, energy savings trust um, and finally lessons learned would be to keep it simple trying to figure out the simplest way to deliver the, the project as possible um, which is about the detailing the design and the communications around it um, so i'll be quick um, um, to just wrap up so future aspirations for us is um, essentially what we wanted to do occupancy monitoring so installing a network of sensors to create a real-time energy dashboard for the building so people walking into the building can see instantly how much is being generated how much is being consumed in the building and in the individual spaces over that day that week that month and the year that will help people really get to grips with what is the reality of operating a building of this nature um that information will eventually become a, a published report, which will be published for, for people to, so that if they are delivering a similar project, they can learn from and like take take what we've done and hopefully build on it and develop a culture in, in, in Scotland around a really progressive retrofit agenda. And finally, we're developing another building called the Glue Factory, which is our other space, and we're going to use a different approach and test the, and test and compare the cost effectiveness and carbon savings, take the learnings, but also just adapt it slightly. Um, I feel like I'm speaking very quickly, um, so I'm going to wrap up now. Um, so I just wanted to finally say just a, a really big heartfelt thank you to everyone at the Green Economy Fund. Um, it's been an absolutely fantastic project, and it's it, it's been it's been very challenging but incredibly rewarding in terms of the uh, the feedback and what the, what the building will be, will be for the next hundred years. Um, and also everyone at the Energy Savings Trust, Graham, Felicity, who have been incredibly supportive of the process. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch, I'm afraid I might be able to be there to sort of be speaking to people in person. But if anyone wants to get, get in touch, just um, if you just search for Civic House Glasgow um, and you can get our contact details. And um, yeah, any questions, any feedback, please let me know. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rob. It's brilliant to see the community coming together at Civic House. And if you can still hear us, keep well. Now, finally, I'd like to introduce you to Felicity Tolley, Programme Manager at Energy Saving Trust. The Energy Saving Trust has administered the Green Economy Fund on behalf of SP Energy Networks since the initial design phase in 2018. Felicity and her team have also evaluated the successes, challenges and developments of all projects along the way. So please put your hands together for Felicity. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, um, so I'm Felicity Tolley, I'm Programme Manager for Scottish Home Renewables and Green Economy Fund at Energy Saving Trust. 
Energy Saving Trust is an independent organisation with a mission to address the climate emergency and Green Economy Fund fits really nicely into that mission. Carol's also helpfully told us, told you what my role in uh, Green Economy Fund was, what our role was, um, so I don't need to say that again, but um, today I've been asked to share some of the learnings. Um, aside from the individual project and technical learnings that we've heard from some of the projects today, there are two main types of learnings. One is learnings coming from feedback from the individual projects. Um, we regularly ask for feedback as part of our administration. And the second is our own learnings and the learnings that we have gained through working with SP Energy Networks on this one. Um, feedback on the fund has been overwhelmingly positive and uh, can be broken down into three main areas, social, economic and environmental impacts. In terms of social impacts, projects have reported improved networks between community organisations and commercial organisations as well, improved understanding of renewable and low carbon technologies within those organisations, and um, the fact that the fund has enabled the provision of key services such as school drop-offs, COVID-19 test drop-offs, food deliveries and a reduction in rural isolation. In terms of economic legacy, we've obviously heard about the jobs created by the fund, which is really key, but a second uh, reported impact was reductions in vehicle running costs for all of those projects that replaced internal combustion engine vehicles with electric vehicles. Other projects reported being able to generate additional revenue through the Green Economy Fund uh, funded um, measures. For example, being able to generate and sell energy or being able to gain things like the renewable heat incentive through um, grants from the government. And in terms of environmental legacy, obviously the key one is the carbon saved by the fund, but uh, projects also reported increased stakeholder appetite for other projects of this type and other investments. So that's a really positive outcome. Project has not been without its challenges. We've heard some of them already. Um, to generalize across feedback from the projects, there have been challenges around legal issues, such as access to land um, for construction. Um, there's been challenges around procurement, such as sourcing technologies, delivery of technologies. Um, and there have also been um, challenges around finding the right technology and having choices around technology options. Key solutions to this include um, consulting with experts as much as possible, um, everything from tech choices to communications, to project management, to finding other funding sources, and um, also providing uh, more time to allow projects to establish and resolve legal issues throughout uh, the funding process. And feedback also really underlined the importance of strong project and stakeholder management and planning throughout the project, something that our development officers such as Graham were able to, to help with. We reacted to feedback throughout the fund, for example, um, allowing our round two projects to have a little bit longer to carry out due diligence after feedback from round one projects. Um, and we instituted a six month extension for all projects um, on, uh, once it became apparent that COVID-19 was going to impact them. Projects also reported that they really enjoyed networking events and that's something that SB Energy Networks will take forward to future funds where um, there were, hopefully won't be so many restrictions on that type of activity. In terms of our own learnings, each project has individually taught us something. We've heard that as well, technically and otherwise. Um, one learning for us has been to have a more streamlined application process. We've heard about the wide range of, of types of projects here, and that meant that we had a one-size-fits-all approach to applications, which was actually too complex for some of our smaller and, and more straightforward projects. So we'll take that forward into to future projects. Um, we've already established that we, we should be, should be um, allocating more time to due diligence, something that we'll take forward as well. And one key finding was um, to take time to engage with the supply chain when setting up the funds. If you're going to do something like um, trigger the ordering of about 60 electric vehicles from the Scottish supply chain, most of them buses and all of them do about the same time, you really, it would help to give the, the supply chain a bit of a heads up there um, and to prevent delays. 
And finally, the key finding um, for us as administrators has been to really underline the importance of risk management. We didn't have global pandemic on our risk register at the start of the project. We do now. Um, but we had other things on there like um, lack of resources, lack of staff availability, illness, um, delays in delivery of technologies. And all of that thinking ahead really helped us to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19 on the project. So finally, um, this has been a really fascinating project to be involved with, and I just wanted to say thank you to Gillian and SB Energy Networks for letting us be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Felicity, and to all of our other speakers. Yeah, you've done so brilliantly. And what an incredible range of inspiring and innovative green projects we have heard about. But now it's time for us to take some questions from you, our wonderful audience. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask Gillian and any of our project speakers, please submit them now using Slido. So our first question is for Gillian. <laughs> Gillian, what do you think was the biggest learning that came from the Green Economy Fund? And if I can remind all our speakers, the more concise our answers, the more questions we'll get through because time's marching on. Um, well, I suppose for me, Carol, the, the biggest learning has been what can be done, essentially. Um, you know, £20 million is a lot of money. Um, and we had a clear vision, clear priorities, and um, you know, with the time scales, so we're, we're able to achieve so much in, in a few years. And just think if more people did that, if we could scale this type of funding throughout the UK, what could be achieved? If you know, we have to do it because you know, we, we have got the goal to become net zero. So um, for me, that is the biggest learning that it can be done. Brilliant, thank you. And the next question is for Rashid. Rashid, how has the Green Economy Fund investment benefited your local community? Again, I'll take it back to the learning, actually, because what we've learned over the course of time has been fabulous in terms of actual true engagement and how we can use the cargo bikes. Um, so for local community, it's actually demonstrating, you know, with the ease of this pedal-assisted vehicle, you can do so much um, for local businesses. Um, and large corporations, as I've said before, you know, the cargo bike can really be tailored. It's one of the unique vehicles that you can take that sort of bespoke um, sort of model and, and operate with um, anybody and everyone. And I think the key findings for us is that we've discovered that really everyone should have a cargo bike whether you're a small business, whether, you know, you're, you're you know, I think it's uh, the, the same sort of things in terms of parking and all those sort of challenges that we have to go through. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I, I stay in a place called Eldersley. I won't harp on too much, but I'm in, I'm in Eldersley, which should be in the map. Many probably haven't heard about it. It's the birthplace of the spiritual king of Scotland, otherwise known as Sir William Wallace. And I'm now looking to do a mini micro hub with the school, the local trust, etc. So it's great because um, my little seven-year-old um, wants a mini cargo bike. <laughs> that is brilliant. Thank <laughs> you, Rashid. So going down the line now, um, Joanna, is enough being done to help the next generation of engineers prepare for a net zero future? And what would you change in green tech education? <laughs> um, well, actually, I'm pleased to say that uh, through the work that Skills Development Scotland are doing, we are very much focused on the jobs, the green jobs of the future and the skills that we are developing as colleges and um, how we support those through the types of education that we offer. But we're also cited on the jobs that are likely to be disrupted by further advances in um, renewable technology and the drive as a nation uh, to become uh, net zero. So I think, you know, there is a lot to do, but we could do more. And, you know, a lot of that is about how much we are able to invest in our teaching facilities and the partnerships that we create with people like SPEN, for example. Um, and I think it's important to recognise that not one single institution can do this on their own. They very much have to do this in partnership. 
Lovely. Thanks, Joanna. Ross, is there a danger that some communities might be left behind in the transition to net zero? And what can be done to overcome that? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. There is definitely, yes, there is a danger that, that some communities are left behind. And I think the temptation is with the scale of what we have to do in terms of transitioning to net zero and, and the scale of societal, environmental and technological change, there's, there's a temptation to look for silver bullets and look for a panacea that's going to do everything for everyone. It's not going to be as straightforward as that. We're going to have to realise that one size isn't going to fit all. My circumstances are different to your circumstances, are different to everyone else in the audience. The way we make the transition will be individual. So we have to have the support in place to make sure that we kind of, ha we have to crack the ability to do it at scale, one, because the scale is massive, but then also it has to be able to be tailored. What is the right technological package? What's the right um, fabric installation package? What's the right educational package for that individual, that building, that household? And I think the only way we crack a, an inclusive transition a just transition is to recognize that yeah one size doesn't fit all we have to be able to to bring people with us and tailor solutions to meet individual need it won't be as simple as just thinking well here's a panacea let's apply it across the board we have to kind of um realize it's more complex than that thank you and felicity um at energy saving trust what do you think made the green economy fund unique in its approach to funding um, I mean, mentioned already the kind of the range of the different types of projects, the focus on the economics and the legacy and creating jobs. Um, but for me, I think the uniqueness comes from the, the focus on additionality in the application process. We were really um, deliberately uh, highlighting and, and uh, encouraging projects to apply for funding where they wouldn't be able to get the funding anywhere else. And in that way, the Green Economy Fund has plugged gaps and created projects that wouldn't have been able to go ahead without that funding. Talking of such things, Gillian, how can people apply for future funding? So, um, as I alluded to earlier on, um, we have a couple of funding options on the horizon. Uh, the first is through our transmission business. Uh, we've been awarded £5 million through that, uh, through Ofgem, uh, for uh, supporting um, our communities who are affected by transmission works and um, for them to kind of develop their skills and knowledge in those areas. Um, details of that are on our website, so if you want to register interest, uh, you can. Um, it's not quite open yet, but uh, hopefully will be um, in the near future, probably beginning of next year. Um, and secondly, we have, we've just about to put our business plan in for ED2, which is our distribution business. And within that, we have requested from Ofgem a bigger fund um, that we hope will basically replicate the Green Economy Fund's work. So, uh, fingers crossed that that's successful. Yes, indeed. And a quick fire for each of you. It's the same question. What was the biggest barrier to making your green visions a reality? If we start with you, Gillian. What was the biggest barrier? Um, I think for me, um, because I've, I, you know, not having experience and, you know, really starting from scratch, the biggest barrier was just getting the processes in place and making it happen. So, um, for me, um, that was probably the biggest barrier. Rashid? Yeah, I think um, the pandemic was a huge uh, barrier that, we, you know, as uh, Felicity mentioned, it's not something that you, you could have planned for. But, but from there, I don't think we would have been where we are today if it wasn't for the pandemic. And that's in the sense of, you know, humanity and neighbourhoods and all the good stuff that has happened from the pandemic. But also it allowed us to almost take a step back and look at the lay of the land and actually make these relationships, do the networking. So rather than going straight into delivery, uh, we had a little bit of a delay in getting our cargo bikes. And again, that allowed us to, to create those networks or partnerships with you know, the, 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 the big corporations with the so smaller independents. And it also allowed us to, uh, something that I've not mentioned is uh, create a model for um, an emergency COVID uh, uh, action plan where via Porta Gabins and cargo bikes, you can deploy these throughout the city very quickly to support people uh, to, to get distribution of poverty, sorry, of uh, medical goods, food, etc. So yeah, that, that's been the biggest barrier, but also the, the light out of the darkness, if you like. Lovely, and Joanna? Yeah, the same as Rashida, actually, the impact of COVID 
was probably the biggest challenge that we faced because our funding tied in with a, a, a building project. And whilst we had the technology installed before we went into the lockdown, we weren't able to harness the full effect of that until we came out the other side of that. But actually, that was a great opportunity. We turned that challenge into an opportunity because it meant that we could take that time to really hone in and refine how we were going to use that, um, the kit that we had installed in the college. And therefore, when we were coming out the other side of that and the Scottish Government was publishing you know, the, the plans for the green recovery, we were already, as our college purpose says, one step ahead. <laughs> we had already um, figured out what it was that we were going to do to support that and had plans well developed. So we, turn, we turned that challenge into an opportunity. Excellent, Ross. Um, yeah, I guess building on that theme of turning a challenge into an opportunity, I think probably the biggest barrier for us were was realising how many moving parts there were to each individual home and, and making an installation where it was absolutely optimised. So I think we knew at the start, we had an idea there were lots of moving parts, but when you get into the meat of it, then you really start and understand that you have, you know, a customer, a tenant who doesn't really understand what's going on, doesn't really get what the technology is going to be about. Then you have a DNO that has regulatory responsibility for the stability of the grid in the area and all sorts of checks. Then you have the retail end of the market, which was a real significant hurdle, as I talked about earlier. And you have to kind of knit all of these things together on the go. And for the person, the end user, you have to make it seem seamless. So like the swan has to be going nice and serene on the lake, but paddling furiously underneath in knitting all of these things together. So that was... Yeah, I think a barrier, a difficulty, a challenge, but also once we'd cracked it, then it was a really valuable lesson that hopefully we'll be able to take forward. Brilliant. Finally, Felicity, the same question to you. Um, I think for me it's, it's been time. We had, you know, almost well, over 100 applications. We had lots of enthusiasm, interest, people wanting to, to crack on with things, but the challenge really was getting everything done as quickly as we, we, were, we had to. Um, it's actually quite hard to spend 20 million pounds when you, <laughs> um, if you have to, to do it across multiple stakeholders, each individual project had multiple stakeholders within it, um, things to be agreed, organized, and it just um, it was a bit of a race at times. Thank you all, and time is actually against us, so we'll press on. Thanks to everyone in the audience who shared a question just there. Now, it's encouraging to hear how these projects could be used as a blueprint for future green initiatives to help us meet our climate targets by 2050. Over the next five years, SP Energy Networks will invest £5 billion pounds to prepare its transmission and distribution networks for what is to come. Now, this is a huge investment, but so is the scale of the challenge. There are expected to be about 30 million electric vehicles on the roads by the year 2050, and 22 million heat pumps will be installed in homes across the UK. So it's my pleasure to hand you over now to Scott Matheson, Director of Network Planning and Regulation, SP Energy Networks, and the man behind the Green Economy Fund. With over 25 years experience with Scottish Power, in 2018, Scott came up with the idea to create a dedicated fund to support green initiatives across Scotland to help the nation achieve its climate change targets. Scott's passion and commitment to the Green Economy Fund has made it the success it is today. And Scott will now discuss what SP Energy Networks is investing to get their network net zero ready and the brilliant new funding opportunities that SP Energy Networks will be offering for the next couple of years. Please give him a big round of applause. Thank you, Carol. And, and can I say how daunting it is to uh, speak in public with uh, yourself who deals with Naga and Dan on a daily basis. And the, so uh, please be kind with me and, and gentle with me. But um, You've got 15 seconds. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it really is a privilege um, to be standing on the stage. So uh, I've got a colleague up in the, in the crowd, Guy Jefferson, who's been presenting throughout the week with luminaries. Um, like Bill Gates and uh, such like prime ministers and, and presidents. And you know, one of my big frustrations working in the heart of an engineering business is actually there's a lot of talk and no action at times with respect to climate change. But the people assembled in this uh, on this uh, platform 
deliver action within the communities. And there's a couple of themes that I want to pick up on. Um, firmly, we believe in just transition and we also believe in climate change. Uh, Carol, again, pointed out from our professional life the, the uh, impact that we can see written in the statistics with respect to weather patterns. And I was minded of a, a, a statement that, uh, or a speech that Professor uh, Stephen Hawking once gave, which revolves around uh, Venus, but if, you give, if you're patient with me for a moment, Venus is about the same size of planet as, as Earth. Um, it's about 95% of the, of the size of Earth, and it has about 85% um, of the density of Earth. And about four billion years ago, it looked a lot like Earth. It had water on the planet, and it could have sustained life. But it went through climate change. And somewhere around two billion years ago, water was completely evaporated on that planet. It's just slightly nearer the sun than us, looked a lot like us. And at the end of his speech, um, Hawking said that effectively, if you meet a climate change denier, then offer to pay their fare to travel to Venus. And I think, you know, that encapsulates it. We, we have a big responsibility um, over the next five to 10 years and making sure that we facilitate as a business a transition in the way that energy is used day in, day out. Our numbers are huge. We have to facilitate in the next, uh, just within our footprint, one and a half million electric vehicles coming onto the grid, somewhere around about one, one million uh, points of ele electricity to be used as a source of heat um, to improve heating and get off gas, the, the dependence on gas in our domestic homes. And that's a big responsibility. And we have to do that throughout the period, keeping the lights on. Because we all take for granted that when we go home at night, we expect to be able to cook the dinner for the family. We expect to be able to throw the switch and the lights come on. And Joanna stated it very clearly for me. I fundamentally, Guy, fundamentally believe that we cannot do this on our own. We rely on the communities. We're a community business. Yes, we're a big corporation. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But every one of us came from the communities that, that we live in and that we provide a public service to. We know that we're fortunate to have global investors who make the investment happen in the network. But we are entirely dependent on the ingenuity and our own entrepreneurship that comes out of the communities that each and every one of our colleagues assembled in this stage demonstrates. It's a real privilege for me um, to, to be up on this, this podium w with the guys. It was great to be able to do the Green Economy Fund. What was even better was to get the relationship between this business and what's actually happening in the communities that, that we, we serve. The other point I want to make, um, and I feel very passionately about, and again, I speak on behalf of my, my own, uh, my operations director who's up, up there as well, is that, is that we want to make this a, a just transition. So I'm a working class kid, brought up in Glasgow, educated in Glasgow and employed in Glasgow, and I know what my community gave me, and I'm proud of it, very proud of it. I believe that people in Pollock Shields East, people in Dumfries and Galloway, up in Fife, and the business that we serve should also enjoy that privilege. This is Gillian's fault for writing that, that speech. <laughs> You'll see I'm a bit emotional about it. The just transition will only happen if corporations like ours also recognise that relationship, that reciprocal relationship they have with the communities and pay it forward back into those communities and then enjoy the benefit. So for me, running and working in an engineering business, there's a benefit from what Ross explained in terms of being able to manage the grid. We will not accommodate that level of new, renewable, low carbon technology, all the jargon that you hear about it, without operating our grid to its physical limits. And there's another famous Scotty, more famous than I said, you can't deny the laws of physics. The technology that these guys are developing will take the pressure off that grid as we build and invest it to accommodate the, 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 the net zero network of the future. But equally, we want to make sure there are jobs. So one of the biggest things I'm really proud of is the jobs that have been created through the green economy. And again, through the efforts, not of, Scott, not of us, but of you and every one of you in the communities that, that we serve. You know, that's no mean feat. And that in itself will create wealth. And I think hopefully we'll get people out of poverty and vulnerable, vulnerable customer situations. So there's nothing I can say other than uh, taking great pride on behalf of the business of the fact that not only have we built something quite remarkable, and, and this lady on my left-hand side is entirely responsible for it. I came up with a harebrained scheme, but she made it happen. 
and made it a success, the success that it is. Um, and we also had the backing of our executive and board, people like Guy got round me and supported when others said, eh, no, you'll never do this, you'll never pull it off, you'll never persuade your board, it won't happen. Well, it did happen. And we're now using this as a springboard to go forward with our net zero fund. It inspired also young professionals within our business to say, why don't we do more of this, Scott? We've got to do more of this. And those people that are driving those future price controls that we negotiate in our crazy business to try and sort things out for a future for our own employees, um, that they were also able to build in new schemes across the three businesses that, um, that Gillian outlined. So I want to thank you for coming along today, thanking Carol for facilitating this, but more importantly, I would like to ask you to join me in thanking in the normal way our colleagues assembled on this stage. Thank you so much, Scott. And have you noticed how humble Scott and Gillian are? And when you think about what they have achieved, wow. And I'm sure the Net Zero Fund will inspire many people in the room to start thinking about how they can supercharge their work on Net Zero. Well, that brings us to the end of our event today and the official close of the Green Economy Fund. The Green Economy Fund's official impact report will also be released next week and I'm sure we're all very excited to see the incredible results that the fund has achieved. It's truly inspiring to see all the amazing ways people are working within their communities to support a green economy. With so much creative thinking, innovation and passion, the future truly is in safe hands. Once again, could we please have a round of applause for all of our speakers today, including Scott. And thank you all for joining us today. I hope you have a wonderful final day at COP26. Take good care. <laughs>